And then our other superstar coach has some really cool, deep, mind-blowing <laughs> uh, insights to share with us. Uh, I'll just let him tell you what he's going to talk about. His name is Mamoon Yusuf. Let's give Mamoon one more big round of applause. So put your hand up if you believe that coaching is the most powerful force for change you've ever experienced. Almost everyone. Um, so if we're defining coaching as the facilitation of growth and change, I think, co I, I, for me personally, coaching is the most powerful transformational thing I've ever been through. Um, and I mean that the actual structure of coaching, like the space between the coach and the client. When I've been a client, some of the biggest breakthroughs I've ever had in my life came in that space, right? And I'm sure it's been similar for many of you, which is probably why you originally thought about becoming coaches. So something that has always blown my mind ever since I was a client and I couldn't work out how in the world the coach thought to ask me that thing, whatever it was, that completely just undid my whole model of the world and made me see the world in a new way. And I've always been like, how the heck did he do that, right? And you know, then I studied coach training and stuff and I can see some of, some of where all of that power comes from. But I've been really curious for quite a while since I started. I know a lot of you know that I do this thing called Quran coaching and I help people with you know, learning the Quran and spiritual development. But something that's always been curious for me is if coaching really is the most powerful force for change on earth, and if you've experienced it firsthand, that's what it feels like, how come it's only been around for like 30 years? Like, what's up with Thomas Leonard? He just, what, he just thought it all up one day and then it was there? I was like, there's got to be, there's got to be more to it. Maybe there's some kind of, uh, what did people do before Thomas Leonard came around, right? Or, or whoever, you know, the, the original founders of coaching. Um, has anybody else ever been curious about that? Yeah. All right, a few people, okay. I'm feeling better. So, now this is a, another thing that kind of struck me is that some of the biggest people in the world of coaching, in the world of personal development and personal growth and stuff like that, a lot of the best books are really to do with spiritual growth. Put your hand up if you agree with that. I, <laughs> good, okay. Um, Don Miguel Ruiz. Freaking, you can just read that book and your world change, your beliefs just change about what's possible. Eckhart Tolle, right? Really deeply spiritual stuff. So my contention, my theory, is that maybe not in the way that it's structured, that we structure it as professionals in the modern world where there's globalization and all these, you know, the internet and all these things, but the actual space that coaching opens up for transformation I believe that's been around for a very long time. And I believe that the people that did it weren't called coaches. And different people in different cultures and different societies and different times called them different things. And the things that they called them, and it kind of freaked me out when I thought about this, when this kind of occurred. They called them gurus. They called them sheikhs in certain parts of the world, shamans. Sages, any other words like that? Teachers, dervishes, thank you. Sufi dervishes, ah, that's a very nice segue, thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Parents, ah, oh, very true. So I'm gonna share with you what I believe happens inside of the space that coaching opens up in order for those, that transformational experience to occur. I believe that there are certain spiritual values that open up a space within a coaching session for crazy, mind-blowing things to happen. Even just in the seminars we've had over the last couple of days, I have to say, I was nervous as hell to teach stuff about spirituality, kind of like, especially from, you know, from my spiritual tradition and everything. And then I saw the stuff that people have been teaching over the last two days, and I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> I don't have nothing to worry about. These, these guys can handle it, right? So, so um, all right, so the stuff that I'm going to teach, these are spiritual values. Now, they come from my tradition, right? I do Quran coaching. This is stuff that I've read in the Quran. Every one of these concepts I'm going to teach, 
I'm actually going to share with you the Arabic words that the Sufis, which is you know the, the spiritual di- you know, the, the spiritual folks who are Muslims, um, use. Um, I was reading a book on the way over here, which is a long because I came from like I live in Barcelona, but I came from Manchester to come here. It was a long journey, and in a bookstore in Chicago, I saw a book by the Dalai Lama called Beyond Religion. I was like, oh, totally need to read that right now. And he gave a brilliant metaphor because he was really talking about extracting the spiritual values from all these different traditions and making them universal so that everyone can benefit regardless of what your personal beliefs are. And what I'm going to share with you right now, I really, it doesn't matter whether you believe what I'm going to say or not, these things are at play. Whether you, it doesn't matter whether or not you believe in gravity, gravity occurs. It doesn't matter or not whether you believe in these principles, they're at play every time you've had a coaching session and your client has had a breakthrough. And the first one is hikmah. Oh, yeah. Don't you know ancient Arabic? <laughs> God. <laughs> I'm actually going to share all of the words in Arabic because I'm going to obviously explain them and translate them, but I can't think of them outside of Arabic because they lose a lot of meaning in translation. But the first of these spiritual values, you know what, before I even get into this, no, I'll tell you this first and then I'll, okay. So hikmah means wisdom. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said wisdom is the lost treasure of the believer, so seek it from wherever it can be found. And I believe, yeah, wisdom is the lost treasure of the believer, so seek it from wherever it can be found. And I believe everybody here is probably seeking some form of wisdom, or you wouldn't even be into personal development or spiritual growth or anything like that. And that's probably how you came across you know, all of this good stuff. The Dalai Lama said something brilliant in that book. He was like, everybody needs water. You need water to survive. (laughs) Not everybody needs vitamin water, but I'm going to have some right now. Uh, Everybody needs water to survive. Um, And water's brilliant. And every single one of your clients needs the water of these spiritual growth principles. They need, everyone in this room and every one of your clients is going to need the water of these universal spiritual principles. These are like hydration for the soul. And he said, Now, tea is also really tasty. And in different parts of the world, they have different types of tea. And you put in spices, and you put in different tea leaves and bags and stuff, and the tea becomes really tasty. And he was like, the different religions and different traditions all over the world are kind of like different tea bags. You can't have tea without water. But you don't need tea to survive. So I would like to invite you all to just have this cup of tea with me. Okay? You don't need this tea to survive, but the water that's in here, I think you're all going to benefit from right now. Does that sound good? Okay. Good. A lot of nodding heads. Hekmah. Wisdom is the lost treasure of the believer. Now, a couple of things about this. Within the space of coaching, because I promise you that within your coaching sessions, when people have these aha moments, it's because you're in, you've created a space for this stuff to happen. How does wisdom happen inside of a coaching session? Half of wisdom, the Sufis say, half of knowledge and half of wisdom is in saying, I don't know. One of the reasons Christian is such a good coach is because when he doesn't know, he's just like, I don't know. When I said, Christian, I've got this great idea. I'm going to go and do Quran coaching. And he's like, I don't know. (laughs) Try it out. See what happens. Half of wisdom is in saying, I don't know. Another really important thing about wisdom according to a lot of spiritual traditions, is the moment judgment enters, wisdom leaves. The moment you judge your client, you're not coaching them anymore. Hekma in Arabic, so this is why I'm using Arabic, right? Hekma, the same root word, you see these three squiggles? <laughs> H-K-M. Um, the same word is used for the same word is used for judgment. It's a different variation of the of the word. 
Arabic, like Hebrew, all of the words in the language are based on a word that has three root letters, and then you can play around with those root letters and create a whole bunch of different words. So hikmah, so wisdom and judgment both come from the same word, and there's a really, like the, the spiritual concept that they believe in is there's only one judge, and it's not you or me. And so they call God the most wise and the judge, because that's something that's reserved for God. And any time you try judging someone, it's like you're, you're stepping out of your place. So wisdom, the first of the spiritual principles, okay. The next one is al-haq, which means, <laughs> and there is a reason I did this line. We'll get back to that. Al-haq is, that's not Arabic. This is just a line. <laughs> Al-haq means truth or reality, but truth. <clears throat> so, yeah, you know what, I'll, just I'll share the Arabic with you, and then I'll tell you what it means. So the Quran says, Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu ittaqillah wa qulu qawlan sadeedah. Be conscious of God and speak the truth. And then there's a secret in the next part. Yuhslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. God will straighten out your situation and wipe away your errors. There are only two reasons we lie. We do it like, well, I do it all the time. Right? Little white lies that I don't really think anything of at the time, but later on when I reflect, I'm just like, what, what was the point of that? So Christian might be like, hey, Moon, have you done this copy yet? And I was like, oh, yeah, like it's 90% done. I'll take 10 more minutes. And I'm thinking, oh, I better get, get to work on that. Right? Now, why would someone make such a, like, why would we do that? Why wouldn't we just tell the truth all the time? Well, there's two reasons. One is because we think not telling the truth will somehow improve the situation, which it never does. But we always think it does in the moment. So the first part of that verse was Yuslih lakum amalakum. Just kind of like, be conscious of God, tell it, speak the truth, God will sort out your situation. That's not even up to you. You speak the truth, your situation will kind of sort itself out. God will take care of the rest. The other reason we lie is to cover up when we screw up. Like, oh yeah, yeah, the copy's all done. Okay, maybe it's not, <laughs> right? So so the, second, so the second secret that's in, in that verse is not only will your situation improve, but God will wipe away your errors. So don't even worry if you've screwed up. The only thing you need to be conscious of is God itself. Now, sometimes your clients will never be as honest with themselves and with the other people in their lives as they are with you. The coaching space itself is a very sacred space and it opens up the space for them to speak their truth right and they might own up and open up to you in ways that they never would with the other people that they work with but there's one truth the sufis say that is the most pertinent the most valuable the most mind-blowing and diana already mentioned it and already kind of alluded to it and it's something that i'm Gonna write in English? <laughs> okay, it's not really English. That's still Arabic. But it's transliterated. The biggest lie we tell ourselves that we believe in, we fall into all the freaking time, is believing in the moment that our thoughts are real. But they're not. We just made them up. Kids know that they make up thoughts because when I was a kid, I used to have imaginary friends. I used to play with Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Raphael, right? And I would whoop them. I was such a better ninja than they were, right? Adam knows. He's like, yeah. I used to hang out with those guys too, right? But the thing with kids is, they know, they'll have these crazy thoughts, but they'll know, you know, then, you know, my mom would call me in for dinner, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go and have dinner now, because I knew they weren't real, they're just imaginary. 
Now, a lot of people have been asking me since, since I mentioned that, I, you know, the whole Bollywood thing. They'd be like, so, Moon, did you get a date, right? After doing that, after going through all that? And I did. And one day, I actually went out on a date at around 7 o'clock, which was weird. So it was 7 o'clock in the evening, but it was a little bit weird because I didn't meet the girl until 9 o'clock. So between seven and nine, I was actually on an imaginary date with a, re- with a really great girl. What was going on? I was thinking, I, I played out the whole thing in my mind. This is insane, right? So this is, this is you know how Christian's always going, we, we, we're all crazy. This is what he means. We are crazy. But the craziest thing that we do is we have these thoughts and we live them out, but we think that they're real. So enough's thoughts is a term that I use to talk about any thought that you have that you actually believe is real. You know how Diana was saying that like 80% of your thoughts are negative anyway? When you realize that none of your thoughts are real, see, it was fu- so let me tell you about my imaginary date. <laughs> the first hour, you know, and a half, and I wasn't, you know, just on the date the whole time, and there weren't other people around, right? I was at home alone, I was just getting ready and stuff like that, and cleaning the house and all that kind of stuff. It was fine when... In the date, I was like James Bond, but in Asian, in Bollywood, right? For that part of the imaginary date, it was great. I was smiling, I was happy, all was good. But right when, when it started to get closer, when I had to like get ready to leave the house and stuff like that, by the way, <laughs> just a bit, an, like, an ecology check here. Has anybody else ever had any experience like this? It's, okay, a few of you. <laughs> okay, maybe we're just crazy and everyone else is normal. I don't know. But okay, so, so it's fine when, all the, when the thoughts are negative and when the imaginary situation is It's really not fine when you don't realize it's imaginary, right? It's not fine when it all turns negative. But if you're aware the whole time that none of your thought is real, then it's no big deal. Because when those thoughts did turn negative and I started freaking out, right, about really small things that really weren't happening in reality, when I just kind of took a deep breath and thought, okay, you know what? <laughs> Fortunately... None of that crazy stuff actually happened. Then I was completely okay. And I could take a deep breath. The peace process helps too, but we'll get to that later. All right, so truth. The biggest truth you can realize for yourself and let your clients know is your thought isn't real. Because they'll come to you and they'll be freaked out over completely imaginary problems. Right? Okay. Okay.